Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. Uh, just one quick announcement before I start today's episode. Uh, if you may remember back in episode 62, I talked to uh, the developer of a Catholic sort of community uh, event planning app called Coin, and uh, that launched last year, maybe around this time. I can't quite remember when it was, uh, but of course, as you can imagine, the pandemic kind of uh, got in the way of things, so they are relaunching now, or they just have relaunched, and uh, the developer, Eric Niehaus, uh, asked me to mention it here. So again, that's episode 62 if you want to go back and learn more about that, and you can uh, find it in your uh, app store or go to meetcoin.com. That's K-O-I-N, meetkoin.com. Recently, uh, on two of our sister podcasts, uh, Way of the Fathers with Mike Aquilina and Catholic Culture Audiobooks, the same figure was featured, St. Anthony of the Desert, St. Anthony Abbott, St. Anthony of Egypt, whatever you want to call him. Uh, Mike did one of his usual uh, biographical episodes, and over on Catholic Culture Audiobooks, we had a uh, complete unabridged recording of St. Athanasius's biography of St. Anthony. And because St. Anthony is actually a very popular uh, figure in the history of the visual arts, particularly painting, I thought it would be cool to do an episode on the history of his representation over the past, I don't know, thousand years or so, or I suppose even more than that. Uh, so I have with me to help me out with that uh, Elizabeth Lev. She's a Catholic art historian. She teaches at Duquesne. University, and she is the author of How Catholic Art Saved the Faith. That is from Sophia Institute Press, is it not? Exactly. Uh, so welcome, Liz. Thank you for coming on the show. Well, thank you. This is fun. It's been really interesting to delve into this very specific subject matter. I've actually enjoyed it a great deal preparing for this chat. Well, I appreciate your uh, taking the time to, to do so much work prepping, uh, because I, I certainly wouldn't be able to do that uh, on my own. I don't I don't have the... The reference points that you do so uh you're you're there in rome right yes and i must say that the pandemic has given me a fair amount of free time so uh sure. i'm very grateful to you for giving me something to do to while away the hours okay so we're talking about again uh saint anthony oh no not saint athanasius uh saint anthony of the desert lived uh for apparently uh over 100 years about 251 to 356 a.d uh, most of what we know about him comes from this this book I mentioned that we have an audio book uh, out of uh, Athanasius's life of Anthony, which was written in Greek around 360. So really not long at all after his death. I, I, if I remember correctly, Athanasius had met Anthony um, and even had some of his was bequeathed some of his belongings, like a cloak. I think uh, it's been a while since I read the whole thing, but uh, so you know a good a good source, and this really. Uh, became a, a, a classic, especially in its Latin translation. Um, about a decade later, maybe by uh, the other another desert father, Evagrius, um, ended up becoming one of the best known works of literature in the Christian world, and and a huge classic in, in the Middle Ages. Translated into a lot of different languages, and uh, took on a very important role in spreading the ideal and inspiration of the ascetical life, the monastic life, the hermetic life. Uh, so he, he isn't the first monk or the first hermit, uh, but he is, uh, much like St. Benedict, kind of a pioneer and uh, one of the great inspirers in that area in that area, a great spiritual teacher. We also have collections of his sayings and a few letters that he dictated. Uh, I believe in Coptic. Uh, so yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. Apparently, he's not very much depicted in the East, uh, which is interesting. Uh, more more picked up in the West. Uh, insofar as the his his he shows up as an icon, basically as a, right. uh, as a, as a as simply an image of a saint to pray to, and in, and as that, not even as much as saints like um, Nicholas of Bari, or for example, right, or right. George, or things like that. Yeah, it's true. So he really uh, catches on in the West, and this may be because of the the dramatic potential. Um, we we find. 
uh, a lot of even in you know early medieval art in the West, a lot of really dramatic and uh, kind of uh, outlandish scenes. You know the the uh, the illuminators of manuscripts love to draw strange creatures already. You know for no reason in in the man in the manuscripts. So uh, it's not too much of a stretch for them to pick up on this. Um, so in in the Middle Ages, you do you do have a lot of illuminated manuscripts of the life of Saint Anthony. Uh, I have one here, I believe. Saint Anthony uh, being uh, harassed by uh, a lobster devil. Here, <laughs> there's actually a bunch yes. of devils, but one of them is clearly a lobster, and he's kind of. I think that's kind of exciting. I think the fact, the mere fact, I get really excited being from, by the way, um, being from Boston. <laughs> I get very excited when when a lobster is depicted anywhere, a proper lobster, not those you know rock Mediterranean lobsters, but like a real proper red. Atlantic lobster. It tells us a bit about the uh, about the author, right? Or the right. artist. That's great. I think it's important to remember, though. I think I think one of the reasons why Anthony's story um, is something that um, is treasured in a very special way is that Anthony's dates. He's what born around two fifty something. So he's born into basically the most vicious. He's he's, he's going to come of age during the most vicious persecution of all, all. and he escapes. You know, the Diocletian persecutions, he escapes sort of the death throes of the Roman Empire trying to crush the Christians. And then he lives through the peace of Constantine. And, and he is very, very, very important for people post peace of Constantine. And this is why I think Athanasius writes his life so quickly. Right. And the How Arian do you be a saint if you're not getting martyred too. anymore? Yeah. It's, and then so so there there are two very important things that are happening here. One, there is the problem of saintliness and holiness without that martyr witness. Like what is it's obvious why 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 Sebastian and Agnes and 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 Lawrence are saints, but how do you do it if you're not being thrown to the lions? Mm -hmm. That's question number one. Mm -hmm. Question number two that is, again, incredibly significant is that as soon as Christianity is legalized, the first thing that happens is everybody shows up and says, oh, yes, I'm so it's so easy to be Christian now. Let me explain to you what Christian is. And you have this age of tremendous heresies. I mean, the Arian heresy is just the tip of the iceberg. So you have completely conflicting, confusing doctrines about how you are to be holy, who is Jesus and how you're supposed to follow him. And in a certain sense, Anthony's simplicity, he closes out the noise. It's like someone, he's like the first guy to like turn off Facebook and Twitter and be like, I'm just not listening. I'm just going to try to listen to the voice of God. And so even though he tries to remove the outside noise of this age of heresies, the reminder is that trying to separate yourself from situations of sin, trying to separate yourself from the confusion, doctrinal confusion, temptation is always going to find you. Mm -hmm. So you need a better center, better than a geographic center, better than a literary center. You just, you need a center. And that center is Jesus. In the case of Anthony, it's very clear in the art. Yeah. And so the fact that he's abused and attacked by demons, often in the, in the form of wild beasts, makes him a good you know analog to these as you said martyrs you know being being eaten by lions and things like that uh it it, it takes on another form but there's there's a very clear uh line between them and him in the form in which his his struggles most famously uh took place he's right. he's being attacked it, and and lions specifically figure in uh, as well so it, it, and it also helps that it parallels um, Jesus's preparation for his mission, right? So Jesus, before he takes on the fullness of his mission of salvation, what does he do? Goes off to the desert. And there in the desert, he is tempted. And so having this figure who, who, who mirrors Jesus's experience of temptation in the desert is also extremely important. And then we bring out this, this array of creatures, lions, of course, lions, of course, have a meaning for the Christians, but I think it's good to remember that they're really, they're thrown ad bestias. So they're thrown to virtually, if it, if it, choose and eats the christians are going to be thrown to them mm -hmm. and so this idea of 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 being thrown to these demons in the in the form of beasts and that kind of the very first part of 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 anthony's imagery really are these very i don't want to say simple icons but they're just very straightforward this is a guy 
who you can talk to about finding a holy life. Here's his face. Here's his little monk's hat. Mm -hmm. Here's his little Tau cross. He might have his little, you know, some little object. He's got a million. His, his story is so complex. He's got a million different attributes. So, you know, it's each it, the artist gets to pick off the shelf which sure. of those attributes he wants to use. And uh, and then we get to these these medieval illuminators who, um, you know, really they're just illuminating a little part of a page, but they like to do it in this very fanciful way. And Anthony lends himself magnificently to that. So you can you can do an illumination that isn't quite so random. Right. It's not quite so well, you know. I don't know what I'm doing. I think I'll stick something here. But you can actually tell an edifying story in that space. And that's a really, really helpful way of making sure the story of, of Anthony gets a kind of second push, a second wave into, into society. And I find it very intriguing, the use of these animals. Now, it's true the story of Athanasius tells us about you know, an array of different beasts. And when we look at the golden legend, which is going to reboot the story of Anthony for the Middle Ages, we hear beasts galore and lions and howling and scratching and you, know, you name it. But what's very, very interesting is the use of animal symbolism in the history of art and literature. Mm -hmm. And if you go all the way back to the Greeks, the Greeks have a way of describing human beings who allow themselves to be taken over by their sensuality, by their senses, by their instincts, by their desires, as half man, half animal. So you've all heard of centaurs, that's rage, when you become so angry you can't really articulate. Uh, you've heard of the, the, the satyr, which is lust. And that memory, of what it's like to be this kind of in prey of instinct to the point where you are nothing more than an animal remains. And as you move towards this period of the Middle Ages, you find these very interesting scribes in the monasteries creating these part, these, these, these chimeric characters that are drawing together things that are from nature, and yet they are a pollution and a perversion of nature. And this is wrestling with the problem that it's natural to, love is natural. We think of, we think of falling in love, wanting to eat, uh, wanting to be with the one we love as something natural. But taken to the point where that leads you, it becomes unnatural. It becomes something that's that's more debauched or perverse. And so they play around with that idea in the manuscripts. And then in the 14th century, they just go nuts with them in the painting. So you just have this incredible array of images where the artists are just playing with this idea. Yeah, so it's interesting. I, I kind of uh, went back to St. Athanasius, and, and I also read the, the Golden Legend, uh, which is, was shorter, the, the, the section, the chapter about Anthony. Um, but I went back to St. Athanasius's account and kind of tracked the development of these different encounters with, with demons. And it's really interesting, you know, first of all, first of all they're not uh, appearing to him in outward form. They're tempting him in his imagination. Then you get these wild beasts. Really, only once uh, later on in the story do you get a, a, a monstrous creature that's a mix of different things, uh, which is which is usually what's portrayed in uh, in visual art. Uh, but I thought maybe uh, I won't read you know everything, all the notes I, I took down here, but uh, because I can come back to specific points later. But I'd like to start with um, a little bit from this the kind of the first instance of attacks from the devil. So. The devil, Athanasius says, Anthony is still young at this point. The devil is dismayed that someone so young is uh, taking on this very holy ascetical life. So uh, the devil, quote, first tried to draw him away from the ascetical life by suggesting the memory of his property because Anthony had been uh, from fairly wealthy parents. Anxiety about his sister because Anthony was left to take care of his sister after his parents died intimacy with his kindred, greed for money and for power, the manifold enjoyment of food and the other pleasures of life. So as you say, these, these, are, these are pretty normal uh, ones starting off. Uh, and finally, the rigor of virtue and the great labor it entailed. He also hinted at the weakness of the body and the duration of time. In a word, he gathered up in his mind a great dust cloud of arguments wishing to withdraw him from his upright purpose. 
And then when this doesn't work, uh, Athanasius says, the devil, quote, then placed his confidence in the weapons in the navel of his belly, glorying in them, for they are the fir- his first snares against the young. So at this point, the devil is tempting him with lust so much by night and day that even onlookers notice that Anthony is clearly struggling, fighting with the devil here. Um, he even takes the form of a woman at night, and Anthony gets rid of this illusion by, quote, meditating on Christ and the nobility uh, that is ours through Christ and the spiritual nature of the soul. He suggests this, the softness of pleasure to Anthony, and Anthony counters this by meditating on punishment by fire and the torment of the worm. And then uh, later on, uh, the devil comes with a whole throng of demons and cuts him with lashes and leaves him lying on the ground in intense pain. So here we have the beginnings of uh, with this woman appearing to him and these demons physically attacking him. You have the beginnings of... Uh, the beginnings of these these temptations and then continuing on when he's about 35 this is where you get the animals coming in so he, first he, the animals are just making tons of noise that the devil fills the place with forms of lions bears leopards bulls serpents apps asps scorpions and wolves each of which was behaving in its natural manner anthony says to them gaily if you had any, any power it would have been enough for one of you to come but because the Lord has deprived you of your strength, you therefore try to frighten me by your numbers. That you take the shape of beasts is proof of your weakness. Then looking up, he sees the roof opening. A ray of light comes down. The pain in his body stops. And he asks the Lord, where were you? Why didn't you appear at the beginning? The Lord says he was there and was waiting to see Anthony struggle. And because Anthony was steadfast, he will always be his helper and will make his name, name known everywhere. Uh, so I just wanted to sort of say all that as kind of a, because that, that gives us a fair amount of, uh, reference point for all the different works of art we're going to see. A lot of the basic, mm-hmm. the basic information is contained in those accounts of his first two assaults, first when he's young, and then when he's 35, the more outlandish things start, start happening. So we see um, at, at the beginning, we, we just we just have the array of the you know, seven deadly sins, exactly. essentially. Yeah. And so we see that the, the mm, sort of Dante-esque almost used the lust for power, lust for women. And then um, I think it's interesting, this attempting to um, remove himself from the environment or circumstances that he would perceive as sinful, i.e. life in the city, right? Because we're talking about these, these city environments. He tries to go out into the countryside and there's a whole body of literature, this Thebiad of, of men who have gone out, including the the, the friendship that's, that's described um, between Anthony and uh, Paul of Thebes, but there's a whole body of people who move out into the desert around Thebes in order to live a holier life. But um, despite the fact that they've, they think they've removed themselves from the material temptations of wealth, of other people, of, of, of food, of gluttony, envy, the, the temptations still return, and they return uh, in the form of this more demonic temptation, which is which takes the form of these hallucinations or these 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 visions that he has. So it's a reminder, I think, in many ways, um, Saint Anthony's story is that it's there's just no escaping temptation, um, but also this this the the the. The adversary is very strong uh, when he fights Anthony, and yet Anthony succeeds in uh, in in quelling this um, very very powerful uh, physical attack. I mean, we hear about him left wounded in pain, suffering, right? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. So, yeah, as you say, it starts out with these kind of the these baseline vices that he's being tempted with. Um, and when, when the devil sees that he can't tempt him in this way, pretty much for the rest of the story, what he's doing is just trying to daunt him, trying to frighten him, try, sometimes trying to disorient and confuse him, because not only is he attacked by uh, wild beasts and demons, but he's also, you know, occasionally the devil will appear in the form of a monk and start chanting or quoting scripture. And, and Anthony isn't, isn't uh, you know, he always comes with complete confidence uh, and uh, sort of uh, dispels dispels the demons in various ways, and and later in time, you know, uh, people are as more people are joining him out the, out in the desert or trying to join him or learn from him, 
you know, they're seeing some of these things happen and he, he has to advise them and he basically just gives them the advice to, to be completely confident and make the sign of the cross and, uh, and kind of uh, just, just be completely unfazed by these things. And, and in the end, you know, uh, the devil actually appears to him and, and is honest with him for once and says, look, why does, why does everybody blame all their problems on me? I just take what people are already thinking and, and amplify it, or I, I just attack the points where they're vulnerable. And, uh, you know, I have no power in myself. And Anthony, at this point, uh, this is late in life, Anthony marvels at the goodness of God and says, you know, you're the father of lies, but in this case, you, you have been forced to tell the truth against your will uh, because, um, because, yeah, because of Christ's death on the cross, you have no power. And so this is basically Anthony's attitude uh, the whole time, and, and he's he's vindicated. I, I I wanted to say that up front because you know when we're looking at so many so many of these depictions, uh, it can be easy to uh, in some of them it can be the fr- the 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 canvas is so dominated by all these crazy demons and outlandish creatures and spectacle uh, that if you don't know the story and how Anthony responded. It can be easy to be just see it as kind of a grotesquery, but uh, if you kind of know how Anthony responded, then you can look at the figure of Anthony as small as it may be on some of these in some of these paintings and kind of see, uh, in many cases, his indifference to what's going on around him. Uh, so, so it's good to kind of know that the full context in his his spiritual. Uh, his spiritual response here, which is given more explicitly or less, depending on which painting you may be looking at. I think it's um, I think it's interesting to see how different artists portray Anthony's reaction. I think there are different reactions on the part of Anthony. Sometimes Anthony um, uh, turns towards some image of, of Christ or the cross, but sometimes you see him really almost buried alive under this, right. the sheer weight of the creatures. And I think another very important thing that you just mentioned is the, the way that this temptation works is not only that of presenting the the deadly sins or the kind of physical torment, but um, the uh, the arrival of a friendly face, a friendly monk in in, in a wonderful painting, um, in um, in a wonderful painting by Buffalmaco in uh, Pisa, uh, you have the Thebaid and you have a monk going to visit another one. He's wearing the big kind of cloak, but you see underneath it the little hoof of a demon who's coming in mm. to steer him wrong. This is to bring wrong teaching or to, you know, stir up trouble by saying, oh, you know what's going on in Rome? I mean, this this idea of kind of creating a kind of a blip in that certainty of his faith. And then also at the very beginning, uh, one of the things that uh, Anthony is tempted. One of the ways they tempt Anthony is that you know, it's going to take a, the man lives to be a hundred years old, right? So you got a hundred years of this ahead of you, and it's going to stink. I mean, there are interesting ways that temptation works, and really, the the story of Athanasius really tries to remind people that temptation comes in many, many different forms. Another interesting thing about Anthony also is the fact that he seems to be the saint who kind of rejects the um, hyper literate world. I mean granted the percentage of people who actually could read in the fourth century is very low but there's a kind of a hyper literate world of people arguing about meaning and senses and the gospels and they're you know writing treatises back and forth and everybody's got their you've got this huge body of writing that's creating confusion and anthony really just rejects all that he he follows people that he sees in his in the period of his preparation he follows people that he sees are good and true he listens very carefully when the scripture is read and he carries it in with him and so he's a he's a self-contained being so for all of his attributes he's actually a self-contained body of scripture of what he remembers his memory is is prodigious his belief that is unshaken by the you know competing doctrines or interviews or whatever it is that people are giving that are creating confusion within the church very very interesting character from that point of view it really is a presentation of how simple confidence can bring sainthood maybe we can look at one of the uh the solo 
portrayals of Anthony first, uh, just to establish some of his attributes here. I've got this one by Moretto de Brescia. It's a funny one because look in the background, you've got him with a little miter sticking. Yeah, sticking what's up, up with in that? The background there, um, probably a way of alluding to his uh, leadership. Um, right, because he um, wasn't even a priest. Yeah. No. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, but this one is much more of a um, a, uh, a representation of his role as the patron of the hospital or the the hospital order that that um, uh, I took care of patients who suffered from the skin disease St. Anthony Spire. So sometimes you see the figure of the pig. The pig was um, the, the monks in this order raised pigs as a means of um, of sustenance basically that's how they paid for they raised and sold pigs so that's what they made money off which is ironic because um, Anthony was a vegetarian and um, the fire on one hand of course is the fire of his love for God but also um, this uh, allusion to this particular disease and then he is also holding a, a crozier which is another bishop's um, yeah that's interesting uh, attribute <laughs> he's, he's pretty he's tricked out pretty in pretty we don't have the way. towel normally he's uh, rep represented with a towel right. cross slash staff or exactly exactly although I'll, to be perfectly honest saint jerome usually runs around with a cardinal hat when there was no such thing as a cardinal at the time of saint <laughs> That's jerome true. That's true. but so the so the tau cross um the the fire the the swine the he usually wears some kind of habit this is a much more of a dolled up mm -hmm. um uh, arrangement he's wearing the 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 beard the age is a very important part because it alludes to yeah. his um to his very long life it's often ordinarily forked. this is a very beautiful picture but um it's it's a little bit um it's a little bit glam for saint anthony you also have the bell there uh, on the crozier, which is also related to being the, the swine herd uh, reference. You would use that to call exactly. in the pigs. Uh, let's see. The one by uh, Jacopo, Jacopo Pontormo, uh, 16th century. Uh, this one features the Tau cross as his only attribute, actually. Uh, I mean, unless mm -hmm. you count the beard as an attribute. And in this one you have, uh, first of all, you have much more of that sort of the simple rude cross as opposed to right. that extremely glamorous uh, crozier that he's carrying in the other one. Um, the Pontormo painting, Pontormo is a Mannerist artist, and the Mannerists are very interested in... Um, in in um in sort of the interior um expressing very profound interior uh experience and so those very haunted eyes of anthony are extremely yes. powerful yes. in yes. this particular image and as a matter of fact they stand out so uh another another interesting like the vecchio one is also has the flames very prominently uh, and, mm -hmm. and when we get to more of these landscape scenes, we're going to see the flames used in, in different ways with kind of yes. multivalent uh, flames there. Uh, and then the Zurbaran, a, a painter I like very much. Uh, yes. Here you have you have his staff uh, and you have the Tau cross appearing in a beam of light. This is more Anthony uh, presumably having a vision of God. He's looking up into the beam of light. Mm -hmm. The pig is kind of backgrounded. Mm -hmm. A very nice. I, I really like this this silhouette of the pig behind him, um, kind of browsing there. And this is this is the first one we we've seen in which he has the book, which is interesting because mm -hmm. that's a, that's a common attribute, and yet he, uh, I don't know if he was illiterate, but he eschewed reading. Uh, exactly. After he became a, a monk. So right. so everything was in his memory, the the psalms he would sing, the the scripture texts, whatever wisdom he had learned from uh, other holy men. Uh, but yet he's always portrayed with this book. Sometimes he's reading it. Sometimes he's just holding it. Presumably, uh, you know this. So this is not meant to be taken entirely literally. I suspect this has something to do. This is a Spanish Counter Reformation painting, and so um, Anthony, uh, the holding up of tradition, um, the uh, idea of a body of uh, of text, a body, a magisterium. The the book becomes a little bit more important in uh, Counter Reformation art because it alludes to the tradition of the magisterium. 
and then uh, we've got this 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 sculpture here by Niklaus of Hagenau, uh, which is the only depiction I've seen where the pig is depicted clearly as a demon. So yeah, these these solo depictions give us kind of a range of of emotions for Anthony uh, in the the Brescia. Uh, he's kind of looking sternly down uh, in the Pontormo. You see more maybe being. Uh, being a little bit alarmed by what he might be seeing off of off canvas, uh, you've got him kind of looking, I guess, fairly placid in the Vecchio, and then in his kind of ecstatic, visionary state in the Zorbaran. So mm. this kind of uh, kind of gives us the range of his attributes and different modes in which he might be portrayed. Uh, should we look at the uh, the uh, Schongauer or the, or the Bosch uh, first? Uh, interesting, interesting. You, you. Why don't you choose? It's your. It is your podcast. Well, I think the Bosch will lead us choose. down a whole rabbit hole. So let's look at the Schongauer and the Michelangelo. <laughs> um, I. Uh, Good point. So Schongauer uh, did this drawing of Saint Anthony, which which then uh, Michelangelo did an imitation of, which I've actually seen because they had uh, um, mm -hmm. Michelangelo's drawings at the Met. Uh, a couple of years mm -hmm. ago. I saw that too. So uh, you can sort of see in this drawing, he's being tugged at on all sides and, and yet kind of, he's like the calm in the center of the storm here. One thing I really like about yes. both of these depictions is, uh, well, I've been trying to get better at letting a painting lead my eye. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I am kind of, my eye is kind of led in a never ending kind of like swirl here around the center. Uh, but then you focus in, you make a choice to focus in on Anthony here. Uh, and he's completely unfazed. So, so here we get uh, some of the more outlandish depictions of demons. I think my favorite it probably being the fish one on the upper yes, left. Yes, I think there. the fish the fish with the strange nose might actually be my favorite too. It's um it's first of all the golden legend will supplant most of the individual stories about saints uh come about 13th 14th century. It's a compilation, the golden legend by Jacopo da Boragine and it basically outlines the saints and the stories for all of the liturgical year. And so it becomes a very convenient go-to object, particularly for artists, but obviously for everybody. It's just a good way to have your saint stories always underfoot. So uh, that becomes kind of the primary uh, source for a lot of artists. And then what's interesting about um, the Schungauer done by Michelangelo here uh, is the use of landscape. You're going to see landscape starting to take, right. it's interesting when the landscape starts to take uh, more and more and more of um, more of the place in the in the story and then another thing that's kind of uh it, it's it is interesting is this amalgamation of creatures like you're going to see that um pretty much constantly throughout renaissance 14th 15th century renaissance art this mixing together of creatures that are generally uh terrifying so i mean you don't there's like not a cuddly kitty cat mm -hmm. in here or there's not like a really placid cow going on here these are all things that are meant to frighten and so that way kind of exploring the way that the imagination the dreamscape kind of takes and 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 and, and moves things around but i think the thing that you notice that's the most significant about it is this the composition which is a very very innovative composition and i think that's what caught michelangelo Eye. The fact of the matter is that the scaly fish and stuff is not the kind of stuff that Michelangelo does. He's interested right. in the human body. Right. But this is a really brilliant composition where we have the spiral constantly moving you around in a circle. And then we have the solidity of that black figured Anthony and the luminosity of his face. So that even though we don't see the light of Jesus above him, we see his face illuminated. So it's a really, really, really interesting way of putting this story together. And I think that's probably what caught Michelangelo's eye when he decided to make a copy of it. Now, the by far the most popular theme from Anthony's life for artists to depict has been the temptation of St. Anthony, the, the bits in the various stories about his life where he is attacked by devils. Uh, but earlier on, you get, as we talked about, icons 
and also uh, some some works that show more different scenes from his life. And chief among these is uh, a series of paintings done by the master of the Osservanza, uh, a medieval work, which uh, hardly has any temptation. Well, it has some temptation, but not in the kind of, uh, for the most part, not in the kind of uh, exterior way that we see in uh, later works. So this will give us a good chance to kind of cover some of the the moments in Anthony's life as well. So let's start with uh, the Osservanza master. What you can what can you tell us about this artist? Well, we call him Osservanza master because uh, the only work his most famous work is this is is, is the work of the Osservanza, and so it means that he's an unknown artist to us. What we can tell from his work. It means his name isn't known, which is not unusual in the late Middle Ages. But what we can tell by this in his work is that he has clearly been exposed to the new developments in painting. Uh, he's, a, he's a Tuscan artist, and he's able to render uh, spaces in a very convincing manner. And so this is a sign that this is a really um, a, a kind of a proto-Renaissance painting, meaning that it's just beginning at the at the Renaissance to begin to use space and narrative in, um, in a very particular way. And what makes this an interesting work, what makes this very special, is that it covers scenes from the life of St. Anthony that aren't usually covered. So for example, kind of the, the, the youthful Anthony, what was he like when he was a boy? And this is a kind of a popular thread in the early 1400s. People like to see stories of St. Nicholas when he was a boy. They like to see stories of saints when they were still very young. We see the young John the Baptist appearing in this period to try to get a sense of kind of where did this extraordinary holiness come from? And you can see in, um, one of these images or one of the panels of this this work uh, you can see these are predella pieces that are little pieces that would have been at the bottom of an altar piece and you can see uh, anthony who is uh, distributing his wealth as you said in uh, in at the very beginning you were talking about how anthony is a boy of some means and when his parents die he uh, he distributes the wealth of his family he puts his sister in a convent and you see here um anthony beautifully dressed holding a money bag uh, coming out of his house. By the way, he's got a beautiful house, very nice Renaissance house, apparently, uh, from the uh, third century. And then uh, we can also see uh, uh, an image of his, the, the devotion. <laughs> I love this, the other picture when you see him attending a mass. So apparently, um, in the uh, late third century, they had full-blown mm -hmm. Renaissance-style churches. I mean, it's very nice to see the story of Anthony's dressed up in con the contemporary clothes of the, fi of the 15th century. He's in a building that's recognizable from the 15th century, and it helps to create a kind of contemporary sense. So in both of these, he appears twice. And Yes, and you can see him kind of poking around in the corner, praying in the back of the churches. It's it's not uncommon to have, because of this new interest in space, they like to be able to show the um, saint in different uh, in different in different places. So they try to they try to kind of double up uh, images, and then after that, you begin to see um, you begin to see the stories of his life going out into the desert, uh, his his finding of his hermitage. Um, meeting with uh, other monks. So it's just, it's an attempt to kind of create what what we would do today. We just make a biopic, right? And so the Master of the Osservanza attempted to create, if you will, a kind of biopic from his youth to his death. You can, one of the images uh, that's, um, that's, a, that's still available is the image of the death of St. Anthony. So it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a nice way to, for people to remember the story. It was a good way to help people to keep the ins and outs and the complexities of his story um, in people's minds. However, that obviously is not going to be where the main thrust of artistic expression is with this, um, with the subject matter. Obviously, the subject they prefer is the, um, are the temptations of St. Anthony. We've got some, some temptation scenes, as I mentioned. Uh, one of them is mentioned in both Athanasius and the Golden Legend, I believe, uh, where Anthony is confronted on his journey with a pile of gold by the side of the road. And uh, 
in this case, it seems to have been removed from the painting. I'm not sure what, what happened. If you, uh, for people looking at it, it's kind of that red splotch next to the, uh, mm -hmm. the hair. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that mark of red you see in the painting is the remain of, remains of something known as bowl, B-O-L-E. And you can see it in the back of the halo of uh, St. Anthony oh. in the picture as well. Bowl is the glue that is used to apply gold gilding. So that's how you know the pile of gold was there, because the red is the glue that would have taken the gold leaf. This middle piece is interesting. We've got these kind of this cra crazy green color on the exterior of the house. I read an interesting article uh, by somebody, an interesting essay, kind of analyzing the colors and the the geometry of this kind of as, as something, you know, I don't know how much he was reading into it, but as something that creates a lot of big sense of uncertainty and uh, kind of uh, risk stepping out into the unknown. What is also very interesting about that scene is the kind of claustrophobic use of perspective. Um, Many of the other pictures we see, um, the uh, Anthony walking out in the desert, we see a tremendous amount of space. And then the artist, um, uh, uh, it gives us a sense of almost, it gives us a kind of a claustrophobic, almost mm. imprisoned sense when we're kind of standing in places that are inhabited and it, even in a space that would be religious, like a church. So it's interesting the way the artist changes his use of space mm. from scene to scene. So we've also got this scene of him being tempted by uh, the devil, taking the form of a woman. We've got, uh, again, it's, yeah, it's interesting. He's got a real little house there instead of a cave that he's going into. Uh, we've mm -hmm. got his death scene, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess the other one worth looking at would be the right frame, the right side of the triptych. Of the triptych where you see him, yes, you see him, uh, this, this sort of embrace with a fellow that we I presume this is his, uh, his yeah. friend Paul of Thebes. And then in the background, you see him encountering the centaur, a, a centaur. And then in the further background, you see him traveling uh, off into the desert. So you see sort of these three different scenes of his life, which again is something that um, perspective uh, gives artists mm -hmm. a new possibility of, of, of recounting. Yeah, I like this embrace here where Paul is, you can't even see Anthony's face. Paul is kind of the dominant figure in this uh, in this composition, maybe indicating his uh, you know his being the master that Anthony has sought out to learn from. Uh, right, right. So exactly, he's he he allows himself to be engulfed in this. So even the way that the figures, I mean, he's he's very he's very mm. Christ-like. The yeah, that's true. Of, uh, Paul of Thebes. So now it's time to address the uh, the big elephant in the room, somebody who will be uh, not only the, the by far the most complex uh, portrayal of the temptation of St. Anthony discussed here, but also one of the most influential, uh, that of Hieronymus Bosch. He portrayed uh, this a number of different times in a number of different ways, but the, the main one we'll talk about here is his Bosch triptych. So what can you tell us about the overall... Uh, context of this piece. It's a it's a work that fits into the tastes of um, uh, Hieronymus Bosch. He uh, the there's a sort of a body of work that involves these um, uh, figures that sort of move into a kind of fantasy land. So whether it's the Garden of Earthly Delights, Versions of the Last Judgment, or uh, the uh, different times he tackled the subject matter of of Saint Anthony, and the one of the things to remember is the period that he's working in. So let's let's start out with these these works are very daunting. Uh, this one is in Lisbon, but his works that are in the Prado they are very. You know, once that work is in the room, nobody looks at anything else because you get caught up into this world that he presents, and. To bear in mind the, the, the time when this particular um, triptych of Saint, the Temptation of St. Anthony was being produced, we are in 1501. So if you remember the Y2K craziness as you were moving into the you know third millennium over the year 2000, um, there's a lot of angst about what is going to happen in 1500, 1500, and 1500 is a jubilee year. So we deal with you know, tremendous senses of spirituality as people are traveling to Rome, they're coming to um, 
I'm coming for this indulgence. I mean, there's there's this sense of a of, of tremendous changes in place. On top of that, there's a lot of spiritual disquiet. I mean, the Protestant Reformation is 17 or 16 years away, but the grumblings, the ground stirrings that will lead to the Protestant Reformation are there. They're, 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 they're heterodox teachings that are taking place. There's pestilence. So you have a context of a people who are very, very spiritually troubled, and particularly in Germany, which is where Bosch is working, um, they turn a lot to witchcraft, and they turn to trying to kind of control or foresee things through astrology and the elements and trying to understand nature. And so what Bosch is really doing here is he's producing a work that speaks particularly to this people that are trying to read the signs in the sky and trying to manipulate the signs of the earth in order to give them some peace, but really showing that there is no peace. So there are three pieces to this triptych. There's the central larger panel, and where we'll see Anthony uh, surrounded by, again, these temptations. And then there's a panel on the left and the right. When they are closed, they show the image of Jesus' arrest and crucifixion. So again, already thinking, returning to the idea of St. Anthony, who is following in the footsteps of Christ's sacrifice without actually being a martyr. However, by showing this closed image of Jesus's arrest and sacrifice, and then you open up and see the life or the temptations of Anthony. Again, it draws that parallel to how the, the battle against temptation can be heroic like martyrdom. So uh, let's look at the left panel then. The, the largest figures in this are these figures carrying somebody who's clearly, I don't know, exhausted, dead, having been beaten, I don't know, uh, across this bridge. It's, so what you have is the sort of the, the moment after uh, the elevation of St. Anthony. So the left and the right panels are kind of, the left panel is an introduction to the central scene. So we're kind of leading up to the temptations. And the left and the right panel are kind of going to lead up to the seven deadly sins. So they're going to list the seven deadly sins. And then in the center, you have the full uh, explosion of uh, the temptation at work. But the, the painting actually, you have the levitation of uh, St. Anthony, you were talking about that earlier, as he's floating on the back of the this kind of crazy bat-winged frog in midair, praying. So he's gazing upwards, he's praying very calmly, but he's surrounded by, on the left-hand side, by these strange creatures. There's this kind of fox face holding the branch, and there's a mermaid, a merman figure riding a fish. And in that imagery, um, uh, the fox, that kind of that uh, the the idea of the the clever devious creature, uh, the mermaid, merman, the the quintessential image of the song that leads you astray. So this is a kind of flattery and deceit you see on this side and on the left hand side, and then uh, above him you have these kind of strange inverted human figures. So you've got the guy who's like bending over. You have fish literally right. out of water. Right? Because the metaphor get any more obvious, you have fish that are out of water. And that alludes to a certain sense of what witchcraft is doing, kind of perverting that which is natural, turning mm -hmm. everything upside down. It alludes to this interest in sorcery and witchcraft, which is taking place in this period. So much so that in uh, 1489, Pope Innocent VIII has to specifically send a decree to Germany to address the problem of witchcraft and the things that people are doing. I actually have a little quote here because it's a little, it's a little shocking to think of what's, um, what's going on in this period. He talks about the horrid offenses, the slain infants in their mother's wombs, and how people are uh, in their, their, their they, they do not think at all about the crimes they are committing because they are so in the throes of envy. So it's a really, it's a very, uh, uh, 
powerful condemnation that gets sent up into that area shortly before the production of this work. And so these the, many ways, Bosch is using a, a very complex pictorial language to address his contemporaries' fascination with things that will simply lead them profoundly astray. So those figures you were talking about before, you see um, uh, Anthony who's being tempted in the air. Anthony is indeed the figure who is being carried by the three men down below. He's exhausted. Ordinarily in the life of, um, of Anthony is told by Athanasius, there's only one man that carries him. But in this case, there are three. And the man in the front in the red, whose face is most visible, is believed by several scholars to be indeed mm. the portrait of Hieronymus Bosch, showing himself it's almost like a signature in the middle of the painting, helping Anthony back back to his back to his cave. When you talk about uh, the left side kind of leading into the central panel, it kind of puts a new, uh, I don't know, a new sense for me of what is going on at the very bottom there with these figures with the 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 papers uh under the bridge uh because you know it all, it almost mm -hmm. starts to look like a plan of attack or you know or a kind of a war room uh you know and another message coming back from the front there the central the the central panel being where most of the action is taking place and then you've got these other guys it does. It has a kind of a neat, kind of a neat, you know, preparation of attacks, or 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 whatever. This the the very strange faced figure seems to be really amused by what he's reading. It just it's a it's a very surprising little little conspiratorial gathering, and then this other figure who's coming towards him is a very very interesting figure as well. He's holding his his sleep slip of paper, and again remembering that the presence of these papers, the presence of this printed material, is also interesting because. Because this, of course, is the age as the printing press is beginning to come online. And the idea of the transmitting right. of ideas via paper, which becomes very, um, you know, kind of like the consequences right. of Twitter and Facebook today. And uh, the figure, the, but, but remembering, to keeping, keeping a focus that he's presenting to us these different types of sins, um, this interesting figure in the skates, this right. bird in the skates, is an allusion to actually um, a contemporary series of tales, but its its direct illusion is how one slides into sin. So uh, this this way of talking about becoming sinful, not because you actively want something, but because you just don't have the will or the energy or the desire to get up and fight temptation and you just slide, mm. you skate into sin. So in this one, we have the representation of the image of sloth, which is also very, it's an interesting uh, way that he depicts these different sins. I just noticed this, uh, this bird on the ice here. The other, the, the, the re there's like a real bird that seems to have been shot with an arrow unless uh, that's just a smudge there. You see you see what I'm saying? No, I think it's an arrow. Yeah, the motif of the penetrated object, you're gonna see, we're gonna see this a lot, that he has images of things that have been transfixed by arrows, pierced with daggers. This is a very, um, it's a very uh, common motif in, in mm -hmm. actually a lot of Bosch's work, but in these particular paintings, you see a lot of these kind of, you know, stabbing, penetrating, puncturing, traumatic wounds that, that happen. The little group of figures over in the right, who are, I think, are a little easier for all of us to figure out. One, you can recognize what is a, a monk's uh, outfit, and that sort of the figure is somewhat, there's some girth to that, to that animal. So it seems to be playing on the very old trope of the, uh, uh, the uh, hungry monks. But the most important and the most interesting one is the one who faces towards us wearing the mitre who is clearly represented as a bishop. He's got a kind of a version of a crozier and he's holding his hand up as if, you know, expounding. And this is a representation of heresy. This is a representation of members of the church who are teaching the wrong thing and how they are uh, themselves an image of pride 
entertain the idea that I'm going to tell you what, what, what the Gospels mean because I've decided I know more than everybody else, that that kind of pride is what is the vice that it's representing. But at the same time, it's it's also addressing these, these very real problems that are taking place that are beginning to take foment in Germany in the very And he's gesturing years. maybe towards oh, this the, uh, 16th guy. Century. Uh, um, who has an arrow in his head? Yes. Another arrow. I just yes, noticed. that's strange. Who has an arrow in his head? Yes, yes, the light motif of the arrow in his head. Yes, that's a. And what's interesting is the woman who is inside. So you see this house, which is obviously made from the buttocks of that man. But when you look inside the the building, that's a prostitute waiting for a client. So, you know, we have we 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 move and and prostitution, by the way, is um, is classified mm, as a sin of avarice. The strange fish in I the see. red case with the wheels. Um, you see him eating but as he's eating he's already got his eye he's got his eye on this little ball right in front of him and this apparently is envy you know you're consuming and then you want to consume something else and you want to consume something else so so again if we look at the structure here we have anthony in the center we have anthony at the top too but circling all around him is the spiral of different types of temptations and then from there we move over to the right panel where uh, we see, again, um, temptations of pleasure. I, I'm trying to think of another way of putting it, but really the fastest way for me to put this to you is to explain this, is to simply say these are the, 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 the pleasures mm. of the high life, right? So um, we see here mm, mm, gluttony and lust depicted in a far more uh, focused way. I mean, lust is omnipresent in in all of the panels but this one uh it makes a makes a makes a little bit more of a point of it so again we have anthony he's uh seated against a rock and he looks he doesn't look quite towards us but he looks away from the most obvious temptation in front of him which is the nude figure he's holding the the book the the the, 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 the scriptures and we might as well just start here at the bottom in the most obvious images um, you have the table set with bread and wine right so um, again setting the table with bread and wine also kind of perverts the 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 concept of the Eucharist but you have the pleasures of the table you have a musician figure sort of he's he's blowing basically smoke from his inverted pipes so the pleasures of um uh of the moment mm. this kind of vanitas you have a <laughs> you have on the right a giant stomach with feet which i think is a pretty evident allusion to you know gluttony <laughs> which again is being right. pierced with a um, knife because that is apparently a thing and then uh underneath the table there's one figure who's lying down and his feet are extended upwards he's holding a sword and if you look he's actually got like the glove of a um mm of a yeah. knight in his hand. And even as he holds up the sword, he's been wounded on his leg and another man is coming out from the table um, who is slitting his throat. And it's interesting because that part of the panel is right behind the panel of uh, Jesus's arrest where front and center of that image, you have St. Peter mm. cutting off the ear very interesting of the man who's come to arrest christ and so it's it, it is a kind of a live by the sword die by the sword kind of message so we throw in wrath um in the midst of the now doesn't a guy with gluttony. his legs stuck in a pot doesn't that have a, a tra traditional meaning uh i i feel like i i read something about that but i can't remember what so yeah the, the leg stuck in the pot has has a couple of one is a sexual connotation of being caught in the in, in flagrante delecto but another another interpretation interpretation and that's uh the other interpretation which is uh actually more traditional to germany uh is that it's gluttony again so we go up and uh hey there's a fish with an arrow some kind of uh cat figure is grabbing that fish <laughs> uh <laughs> I feel like there's a I feel like there's a right. drinking game. About so we've got this happen. woman, we've got this old kind of benevolent crone looking figure, uh, pouring some wine uh, into a bowl held by an imp. 
Yeah, she has a very strange perversion of a right. halo. I mean, that's that that sort of circular thing around her head, and even the blue mantle around her face is these and, and, and the juxtaposition of that figure pouring, you know, a, a little wine to the to the figure who's already reclining and can't get up. And then the younger woman who is nude down below, this kind of playing off this imagery that looks, this woman clinging to the tree, so Eve-like. And then the woman ah. in blue with the halo, Mary-like. And again, right. this kind of playing with uh, uh, this upside down, this perverting and um, and uh, contorting of traditional Yeah, the old imagery. woman, is, she's almost like the, the procurer or the, you know, the the madam in this scenario, yes. um, the hostess. As a matter of fact, there is a secondary allusion to that. Um, this is a um, this is a triptych that was made for a hospital dedicated to St. Anthony that treated people who suffered from the, the disease that's known as St. Anthony's fire. And one of the things that they were given as a kind of medicinal treatment was wine poured over the relics of St. Anthony in the, in the church. And so this feeding or giving of wine to the prone figure also is potentially a mockery of the healing hmm. work of the monks for whom oh, very this panel was painted. We've got a kind of a battle scene. You know, it's interesting. Uh, Athanasius, yep. uh, Bosch's portrayals reflect a number of things from Athanasius's account. One of them, you know, Anthony is uh, at times the devils appeared to him as as soldiers and in, in armor, uh, making a lot of clamor. And then there's another uh, another bit that some of these uh, these imps make me think of as well. He says that demons uh, struck him blows, but he kept saying, nothing will separate me from the love of Christ. And at this, they struck one another instead. Uh, and, and at another point later on, when people outside of his cell are hearing devils messing with him and they're concerned and yelling in there to ask if he's OK, he says not to be disturbed. But he says, make the sign of make the sign of the cross and go away boldly, leaving these to be laughing stocks of themselves. So there is kind of in the absurdity and grotesquery mm -hmm. of these demons. And I think there are points where you see them fighting or killing each other. Uh, I think uh, the kind of basic you know that the devils are trying to disturb anthony but in fact they're only making fools of themselves and he's he's totally unperturbed i think that's reflected in bosch's portrayal i think that i think that particularly um connects with the central panel i think the central panel really sums that up because here you he is he's he's looking sort of Con, in a consternated fashion out towards us. But as we move towards the central panel, you'll see how he really, he's, he just lets the tormentors do their thing. But it is a really, it is a good point that what you see happening out here is sort of the clashing wars of, of men taking place. There's a man in the middle of the water who is uh, fighting some kind of sea monster. And then you have a whole bunch of very sophisticated human constructions all the way around it. I mean, you have a big old piazza, you have a domed building that granted is on fire at the top you have a kind of exotic shaped uh, domed building and then you have a windmill both in the foreground and then in the deep background which is again man's ability to tame nature to his own use these windmills are extremely important in uh, in, in, in Netherlandish and German art because they really are the way that man takes the force of nature and harnesses it mm. to his own desires which is um, a, a kind of magic, if you will. And uh, so he puts these sort of human achievements in the foreground and the, or in this background. And then among them, you have these little teeny tiny human beings who have made this, who are all busy destroying mm -hmm. it as they try to destroy each other. So really, really interesting commentaries on, on, on the human condition here. And again, reflective of an age which is very, very difficult, troubled with sickness, with violence, with confusion. It's it's it, he he really does uh, bring these things to the Shall floor. Shall we look at the center panel now? 
Absolutely. So the center panel, we see um, now we have uh, the other two panels have been leading up to this, where now you have uh, Anthony who's focused in the center and this far greater activity that's going on all around him. And I think actually the way for us to look at it is to really just start by, you know, find Anthony. And you'll see him really dead center of the painting. If you were to kind of take um, a ruler and, and kind of draw lines from the two sides to make an X, you would find that at the center of that X, there is the figure of Anthony uh, wearing his dark habit, as we are accustomed to seeing him, who this time he's looking back towards us. This time he's not looking kind of gazing off in the distance or uh, uh, gazing in He's looking back at us, the beholder. And that's really that moment when he says, this advice, mm, you make yeah. the sign of the cross. There's nothing more they can do to me. This You can see him really transmitting his knowledge, his experience, his wisdom to us as viewers, but not to, uh, not to render Anthony as the, um, as the end in and of itself, Anthony, his whole body is tilted and his hand is moving us so that we look towards the little chapel, if we can call it that, inside in the distance. So the, 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 the line of Anthony draws the viewer's eye for all the confusion all around it. There is a direct image from Anthony to the man inside the little chapel who is Jesus who mirrors the exact same gesture as Anthony, sort of the two fingers up in blessing, and points towards the crucifix, which of course was the mm -hmm. image on the exterior of the panel. And so we see this, you know, Jesus' suffering, and that, that Anthony is very much a witness to Jesus' suffering and partaking in that kind of salvific suffering, in the idea that he's he's undergoing temptations like Jesus like Jesus did in the desert. Uh there's kind of a this this center panel kind of has a, a triptych of its own uh in the upper part in terms of the, the division of color. We've got this flaming town on the left and then this kind of blue, gray, green landscape on the right and this sky. Uh, and then in the middle, we've got this beautiful golden kind of, it's hard to tell. It almost looks like there's a path through the trees there to something beyond. Uh, but this. It looks yeah. like a nice place to be back there on top of everything else, which is not, by the way. Uh, I mean, this is something that you do find in Renaissance art that they do, um, uh, particularly in the art of Fra Angelico, the sort of pointing towards uh, a beyond um, in the in the heavens, you actually have um, this sort of interesting battle taking place. Where on the far left hand side, you see a figure riding a fish. He's like a ghoulish figure riding a fish. He's got a bow over his shoulder, so he's also an apocalyptic image. He's he seems to represent the. And behind him, there are other flying figures that are to represent the the horsemen of the apocalypse coming in and this destruction of the cities and the towns. Then on the other side, you see this sort of interesting battle taking place with this swan type structure and swans are generally the, um, the attribute of Venus. And so you have the swan type structure against this uh, um, uh, armored boat that's flying in the air. So you have the swan versus the armor and this, this, the armor would also indicate something like Mars. And there's a lot of, I mean, without kind of spending a lifetime on this painting, um, a lot of the basis of, um, uh, oh, there's a lot of study of astrology in this period. Let's make it this. Let's make this the short way, the short version. Um, Innocent the fourth discusses. Innocent the eighth discusses at length the uh, again part of this witchcraft sorcery is also uh, an increasing dependence on mm. um, type of astrology. So some of these images. There's another way of looking at these paintings, which becomes extremely complex, in which you realize that they are representing planets. 
um, they're representing elements in this one. This is a lot more obvious. It's, you know, fire, earth, air, water, moist, young, old. I mean, they're bringing together humors. It's bringing together the planets and, 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 and it's bringing together elements in one very, very, very complex image. And that's kind of what's going on here in the background. And then in the middle, we have that. I mean, I just come back to that section over and over again, that little golden glade in the background. We're mm -hmm. just like, how do I get there? Like, I'd really rather be there. Thank you. And it seems like almost that light comes in and illuminates the face of Jesus and that crucifix inside the chapel. So maybe, you know, it's through the suffering of Anthony, through the, the, the self-ethic sacrifice of Christ that we get to this actual garden of, of peace. So we've got kind of a similar scene of dining and, I don't know, maybe games of chance uh, there in the middle. So going back to Anthony, let's, if we look over to the, mm, uh, so next to Anthony is the famous temptress. So when we talk about the, the temptation who comes to him in the form of the woman, this is the woman with the very elegant veil with the pretty red dress, but with that funny little tail that looks a little bit like a siren, mm. a little bit like a lizard. Um, that is the temptress. She is offering wine again to uh, this female figure who seems to be some sort of religious sister and a man who has mm -hmm. only a head and legs. But again, this this vision of uh, jesting a mockery, um, uh, 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 the corruption of youth that's happening here. The most important thing about this whole series of temptations of St. Anthony is that seriously, look at them. Are you tempted by any of this? Like, right. are you looking at any of these going, right. oh yeah, definitely, I, I'd go with that. Right, there's no temptation at all in his temptations. And so it's a way of showing that when human beings kind of create this separate system of, you know, what's going to be important and what they're going to believe in, he kind of rips away the smoke and the mirrors and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the props. And he shows you, for, it shows it to you for the folly it is. And then in back of that tower, what do you see? But a building that looks a little bit like an Italian palazzo. But if you look down below, you see those those arched areas are actually gates with prisons. I and mean, you're looking at this way that human beings create their prison. That's a sundial on there with very little time. They have very little time to be able to work their way out of prison in this life. But the prison in the afterlife is eternal. Yeah, it's interesting that you point out the lack of temptation in the temptations because you know it kind of goes with what i was saying before about the absurdity of these these figures uh you know it's also not there's not also a lot of fear in it i mean it is grotesque it is horrible you know if i was in that scene i might be afraid but um mostly the demons are just these kind of absurd figures uh unlike some of the later representations we'll we'll, we'll see where anthony is being kind of bowled over or daunted in some way uh, by the demons attacking him. Uh, you know, it, it, Bosch highlights the kind of just ridiculousness of these demons and their uh, hijinks. Yeah. I agree, and 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 then later on, I mean, you start seeing these these temptations. They are they are quite tempting. Later versions of the temptations, but these are these are again revealing the absurdity of of being tempted by things of this world, or being unsettled by things of this world, or by just having too much focus on things of this world because they're rickety. No matter how wonderful human beings make things things fall apart. At the beginning of every episode, I always say that this podcast is a production of catholicculture.org, and that's because Catholic Culture is a much bigger apostolate than just our podcasts. We offer so many resources, 
Catholic news and commentary, resources for living the liturgical year, a massive and ever-growing library of Catholic reference material free of charge. Astonishingly, we end up reaching tens of millions of Catholics and potential converts every year, and part of that is because we allow others to reuse our material free of charge. It's widely used in social media, reprinted on other websites, used in television and radio programs. My own podcast is rebroadcast by a Catholic radio station in Texas, and we don't charge them anything to do that. Our articles reappear in print media, magazines, newspapers, parish bulletins. I've personally met priests who say that they use our material for catechesis and for inspiration, for homilies. And this is really an international thing because we get plenty of emails from priests in places like India and Africa who use our material for catechesis. Now, Catholic Culture is a nonprofit, and we run almost entirely on donations. As you can imagine, every year there's sort of a question, okay, are we going to be able to keep going next year? Especially right now, we are struggling financially because our income was down about 25% during the summer of the pandemic, and we lost quite a lot of monthly pledges from people who had been hurt economically. And so it is time for our 2020 Fall Challenge Campaign. Thankfully, a generous donor has offered a matching grant of $100,000, which means, well, it's self-explanatory, all of your gifts between now and December 8th, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, will be matched. If you'd like to help keep this and our other three podcasts going, please go to catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. And if you can't donate, or even if you can, please also keep us in your prayers. We depend on those as much as on financial support. And as I've said many times, we pray for all of our listeners, donors, all of our users every day. Thank you and God bless you. Maybe we can do something. Uh, we'll be looking at a few pieces that more briefly that are clearly inspired by Bosch. But let's let's do a little palette mm-hmm. cleanser here and maybe look at uh, Anibale Karachi's painting. I mean, I think it's kind of. I think it's it's helpful to kind of put these into kind of groupings because it depends on the period you're dealing with in the history of art, how they're going to be tackling uh, this subject. The subject has like a different vibe depending on the period. So for example, uh, Anibale Karachi, who is one of the great counter-reformation painters, um, will give you an image of the temptation of Saint Anthony with a really, really evident image of um, the intercession of, 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 of Jesus. He's not left alone. And that's a, that's a major theme Mm -hmm. in the, um, it's a major theme in the, in the, in the 17th century. So you see him lying on the ground in his cave um it much more classicizing the the demon is really like a satyr right yeah, he's yeah, like yeah. a statue out of the capitoline museums with the with the little pointy ears and half man and probably half goat somewhere uh you see the the lion the griffin the medusa so um using a lot of uh He's building on uh, um, an imagery that's not like the Germans who are taking things from nature and kind of like going to the fish market and putting things together in a really weird way. Instead, Anibale Karachi goes to the Vatican collections or the Capitoline collections and puts things together uh, in this much more classical type of way. But the most important thing about it is that in this work, the the demon is aware of the presence of Jesus. Look at the demon frightened yes, of Jesus, yes. and that there is a much more direct connection between Jesus and Anthony. Because the the, the Counter Reformation wants you to know, temptation's going to come. He's there. Keep your eye on him. It's 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 a much more it's, it's much more kind of powerfully didactic, and a little bit less kind of phantom phantom is phantom as the um, than the ones we were looking at. Uh, made by the Germans. So if you see me where where Bosch is in the midst of an era where uh, there's a lot of contrary teaching, there's violence. I mean, the, the church is really in crisis in the 16th century. By the time Karachi is painting, the church is really, it's getting a full head of steam to navigate itself out of the crisis. So what should we look at along with Karachi then in the same group uh, with the... Uh... 
with the lo- Veronese. Did you? I think I saw you had yes, Veronese yes, yes, in here. Did I? Veronese. So Veronese. Veronese is another uh, art. There we go. Veronese is another artist of uh, this. He's, he's a little earlier than. Um, uh, uh, a little bit earlier than Karachi, but in this particular case, Venetian also, Veronese. And uh, you see this, he's being literally <laughs> submerged. And this is what I was referring to about, you know, sometimes uh, those nice those nice German ones we were looking at, St. Anthony is completely unfazed. But here, you know, he's, he's fending off these figures that have literally... It overwhelmed him. This the 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 muscle bound. I don't know. It looks like that guy. That this, that body is very strange. It's like a beautiful classical body, and then Veronese just decided to add all these like extra muscles that don't exist. <laughs> but again, remember like the classical vein, right. not not taking nature and like grafting together strange things, but taking something that is by its nature beautiful and then somehow distorting it. And then on the other hand, as he tries to raise his hand to ward off these evil figures, you have this sort of very voluptuous woman who is uh, pulling her, pulling his hand towards her. And then interestingly, the foot, this is a, this is another very big counter reformation thing. The foot of um, Anthony is coming out towards you. So you get involved in the scene. I'm kind of so confused just, about where that are, leg is coming from, honestly, based on the proportion. It, it of the is, figure. it is true. It's, it's, it's something you, you are right to be confused, <laughs> but it, <laughs> you are right. This must be this must be Veronese must have been having a bad sketching day. But yes, the, the proportions of the body of Anthony are a little bit funny, which is, I think, why this is not one of the most famous sure. paintings by Paolo Veronese. But it's interesting because most of the ones where you see where he's Anthony is on his back and really being overwhelmed are with these crazy demons. This one is the figures are entirely human, uh, or exactly. except in less except exactly. the extra it, muscles, you know. That's the difference. The that's that's the difference. The Italians, this particular period, there are the animals. They're they're interested in the the human figures. You can see the effect of the Renaissance still holding strong. Should we look at Lelio Orsi, Orsi now? He's a contemporary of uh, Anibale Caracci, and again, this time the demons they they sneak up behind him. He's surrounded in this golden glow, and he doesn't lift his eyes from the mm-hmm. scripture. So we have we've already had the discussion about the the Anthony being fixated on scripture. His uh, cross doesn't look like a Tau cross. His cross looks like a Latin cross. But again, remember the audience you are producing the mm-hmm. work for in a period where. Uh, you're trying to really maintain the idea of a tradition and a magisterium. And the church has writings that go back to the very beginning, whereas the Protestant Reformation has people who showed up in the 16th century and started reinterpreting scripture. So that's why the book will take on. So as a matter of fact, in the uh, Veronese, he's holding on to a book. Like what he's grabbing onto for dear life is the book. Well, let's look at the Grunewald quickly. Right. So this is the Eisenheim altarpiece where you see the story of St. Anthony that's contained within underneath the, the images of the, uh, the crucifixion. And you open it in the wings. It was made for uh, these hospitalers of St. Anthony who were uh, involved with treating St. Anthony's fire. So this is, it's very much a St. Anthony altarpiece. As a matter of fact, he's standing on the right-hand side in the closed version of the triptych as well. And then in the interior version, you have, in the interior wings, you have, um, again, Anthony and St. Paul. And on the right, you have um, the temptation of St. Anthony. And we are back to these, we are back to these very uh, exotic looking creatures where you take, you yeah. know, le- the you take a, a rhinoceros horn and you put some feathers on it. I mean, this webbing and 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 frog skin and and in the midst of it again, you see a somewhat tormented Anthony who's having you know his hair pulled. This 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 I think tries to uh, address the physical pain mm-hmm. that, that he um, feels during the second or the the temptation that takes place during his thirties. And these demons look much more like the ones we're going to see in Nicholas Manuel Deutsch and in uh, Max Ernst. Uh, in that they're they're larger figures they're dominating anthony rather than just yes. sort of like 
you know, Little. dancing around him. And they're also kind of hard to distinguish that the, the, the colors and the shapes are kind of a, conf a massive confusion uh, to some extent. And then you have Christ at the Absolutely. top there. Can't miss that mm -hmm. uh, on mm -hmm. the right side. Now, is this diptych, is this, this is actually part of the Eisenheim uh, altarpiece? Yes. One of the few that we're looking at that it is as much kind of sui generis as Bosch's depiction. Uh, this is Domenicus van Wienen, if that's how you pronounce it, W-I-J-N-E-N. -E this is a late 17th century piece. We've we've got some sort of standard depictions of the deadly sins in the area immediately surrounding Anthony. Um, I don't I don't think we need to get too much into that, but what of the kind of huge chaotic streams of figures coming out of these globes? Well, I'm really glad that you turned me on to this because I'd never seen it before. And I find it, and when I first saw it, this is, I was saying to you, it's not, it's, it's very unusual that I can't place a work for its date and place. And so I was, I was somewhat troubled by this one. It looks so modern. And yet there are a few things in the figures that look, you know, good old fashioned 17th century. And it, I couldn't quite give it a place. Then you told me, of course, it was from about 1680, 1690. So this is actually a really interesting painting. Uh, he, uh, as his name suggests, is a Northern European painter, but he comes to Rome um, uh, right around, oh, 1650-1660. Now, what's been going on 1650-1660? Galileo. And there's a fascination with the cosmos, these heavenly bodies, the movements of the spheres in the heavens. I mean, it's, it is an age. Rome is, is alive with these discussions about what is happening in the heavens. And then, of course, even in Holland, we have Kepler, who is you know, already publishing his, his findings about how the heavens and the earth move. So it's a really fascinating reflection on this 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 interest in trying to represent the heavens as a matter of fact the person who this who who van wienen seems the closest to is in many ways salvador dali who also comes to rome and as he's thinking about atomic energy he begins to develop these sort of strange surreal fascinations with things that hmm. take us out of this world and into a kind of heavenly cosmos of the artist's imagination and that's and it's well suited to saint anthony who is taken out out of the material grounding of this world to see sort of bigger, he levitates, he, he, he experiences uh, the cosmos, the, the, the existential good and evil in the world. So I, it, it's a really, really interesting way that this artist absolutely uniquely addresses the, the question. The lower left-hand part of the painting is where you see a man who is grounded in good old-fashioned 17th century uh, training. The, the, the body of St. Anthony lies heavily on the ground. You can see the beautiful woven mm. mat. I guess um, Van Wienen passed through uh, Venice. They love to do mats in Venice. You have a kind of a still life in the lower left-hand corner of, you know, the various attributes. So you'll have the bell and the book. You'll have a skull to allude to mortality, the memento mori. You'll have, um, you'll have the rosary. And then forming kind of an immediate uh, circle around him are these different images of um, right. of the of the deadly sins, and then you move through this this rather exceptional vision of these people of the cosmos, which actually do have a few precedents in. Um, in some interesting northern Counter Reformation paintings, so there's some, so there's some paintings of um, there's a painting of uh, in Milan. Actually, it's in the Louvre today. It was painted for Charles Borromeo of the um, of the Ascension of Christ, which is taking place in a luminous sphere, and he's moving up towards the heavens. You can see all these sort of numerous uh, uh, ethereal angels around him. So there is there is a little bit of a of a of a, of a precedent of what in what this artist is doing, but he does it in in his absolutely own inimitable way, mixing in a little bit. I should also say 
today, mixing in a little bit of imagery from the classical world. If you look into that stream of light, which is coming from the, the it's just like an opening in the dark cloud on the right hand side. It, it, it passes almost through that, that round planet. Uh, it looks like, you know, Thanos the Destroyer is having a bit of a field day. And then it sprays outwards. And in the middle, you can see the figure of a young, uh, sort of figure of a person who's falling, surrounded by two wheels on either side, which is highly likely oh, yes. uh, Icarus in the famous image. Of, I'm sorry, not Icarus, it's Phaeton in the famous falling right, of right, the, right. the chariot. So uh, who do you think all these figures are? I think they're probably, you know, souls, and 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 he's this image of these souls and the 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 forward and backwards of 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 history. Yes, yeah. but very let's, very let's interesting. Let's move on and look at a couple of these pieces, uh, mostly seventeenth century, uh, influenced by Bosch. So Jus van Kreisbeck, obviously another Northern European here. Um, this is this is very Bosch like, except you have a greater, perhaps a greater number of human figures or humanoid figures, uh, predominating here. Yes. Um, and and also this kind of very conceptual thing with this human head, and then all these guys yes. inside it, demons coming out of the mouth, but then in the in the brain area, that's kind of gross. Uh, you've got all human figures, which is interesting, making plans, drawing, uh, it seems to represent the imagination. Then you've got a bunch of ducks or something on top. I don't know. I don't know what you uh, what you make of that. Well, there there are a couple of things that strike me about it. One is it has a sort of a striking uh, resemblance to the way that Caravaggio does the famous Medusa. This this representation of a face that's in such angst mm. is a is a very edgy type of um, painting, which we see in, for example, um, the Jonathan right, Olive right. Rains of Caravaggio's paintings from about sixteen sixty. And I, there's no, I, Jus van Kreisbeck is, um, is like a baker from Belgium. So I don't think he actually came to Rome, but I, the works of Caravaggio make their way throughout Europe. So it's interesting that he captures such a um, vivid and, 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 and powerful expression on, 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 on the figure's face. And the, the other thing that I, I find, I, I find myself wondering um, because these works don't unfortunately come with the painter who says, I painted this thinking this, and I painted that thinking that, but there's part of it. I do sort of wonder as you see the face of Anthony, whose eyes seem to be turned into, he's sitting under the tree, um, uh, Anthony, his, his eyes, his head is tilted in the same direction. His eyes are sort of tilted in a kind of horror towards that woman with a lot of the whites of the eyes showing. And, and I'm wondering if that sort of head teeming with I, concepts and visions is actually in some ways uh, a representation of Anthony himself. So kind of he sits there under the tree, but this 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 head with things flying out of it and, and teeming in it and, and pouring, yeah. you know, left and right. Is that indeed a kind of psychological reflection of what's happening inside the head of Anthony during yeah. his vision? And the other notable detail here is the pig. Uh, I think the only time you see him in an action sequence or the, the, the poor pig is being harassed He's being ridden by one imp, and he's having his tail pulled by another. Let's finally look at this Van Els, yeah, which I really like, especially as a portrait of St. Anthony. So we, here we have Anthony in a kind of... Uh, this is actually one of the few where we see him... Uh, we, we see this in Dali and a couple of the others, but this is one of the few where we see him actually war kind of warding off the visions and temptations directly. He's kind of holding his hand out there. And instead of just looking off into the distance or at the crucifix and ignoring them, we see him kind of actively engaging with um, the, yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. The the Van Elst is, spends most of his life in Rome. He, even though obviously he's a northern painter, is very interesting uh, blending of the two. The figures are you'll notice as opposed to the um, the other northern versions we've been looking at. The key figures: the woman who is tempting, the figure of Anthony, the crucifix, and then this kind of fate procurous time figure that is standing behind her that kind of distaff mm -hmm. in her hand so she is um, I think the personification of what it means to waste time or to be tricked into sin and then having time ah. cut off for you so she's, she's, she, so um, and, and that's perfectly well. You can consider that witchcraft, but um, that figure seems to have a little bit more of a classical uh, meaning. She also manages to sum up a couple of other um, uh, sins uh, while she's at it, because, of course, the knife can always be used to refer to wrath and the purse. Uh, is is avarice, as is, of course, the idea that she mm -hmm. is the procuress for. I mean, she's standing there as if in any other German painting, if it were not this subject matter, she would be the procuress of the nude female figure. So it's it. She's she's a very charged. And the bottom right is probably the most creepy demon I think that we've seen in in any of these. <laughs> the one yeah. reclining the in mouth armor with the with mouth the with the. Yeah. Jewel, kind of, yeah. That's... Yeah, the worst. Yeah, it looks like it looks like uh, looks like what's right. it, that alien yeah. in the alien totally. movies. But the the part I find disconcerting is it looks like it's posing with its knee up, it's like a centerfold alien demon. Right. It's like, right. what are you doing? And those figures. So in in the art that the that uh, Van El sees a lot of, that corner often gets used for like some voluptuous female figure who's often kind of sitting there, like a you know a nymph or something over in the corner. And so the fact that you've got like the demon kind of posing, it's in his come hither right. position. Uh, shall we move on to Cezanne here? getting more into modern things. So we have this huge leap. I mean, we are in, um, we, we were just in uh, 17, 18, 1680, 1690s. The, the, the German ones uh, basically run for, through the 1600s, taking us up to 1680, 1690. And then we have a kind of like a moratorium on this subject matter until the 19th century. And a lot of it is because there's a kind of this big slowdown in the production of religious art throughout Europe during the turbulent years of um, the late uh, 18th century, obviously with the revolutions going on. And we see, particularly in France, um, a big revival uh, once um, the restoration after the French Revolution, after the fall of Napoleon in 1815, there's a, there's a gradual restoration of the Catholic faith in, in, in France, and you see a lot more religious art produced in that period. And uh, St. Anthony, as the 19th century begins to move on, it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon. The, the French, particularly the French, this is just this question that really regards the French, uh, under the revolution, they have they taste sexual liberty. They, you know, you do what you want. The 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 the, the there's there's the they they break down the uh, morals and customs and traditions which seem to them as kind of confines. And so now there's this new kind of explosion of uh, there's been an explosion of of sexuality. It's like Pandora's box. And this religious revival is trying to put everything back in the box, but that's not going to happen. And so um, by the mid 19th century, there's a lot of interest in this tension that uh, one feels between the instinctive desire and, you know, what is expected that one does. And one of the people who really explores this for his entire life is, uh, is Flaubert. So Flaubert, who's famous for writing Madame Bovary, which of course is the story of this woman who, whose, whose, whose desires eventually lead her and her husband and her whole family to ruin. Um, he spent his entire life, he considered his version 
of the temptation of saint anthony he thought that was his masterpiece his whole life he wrote three versions of it and the first version was kind of a caricature which was you know, playing the first version is kind of playing on songs that people used to sing about the behavior of the clergy but then it turns into this incredibly well thought out dialogue it's like a play broken into these separate parts where Anthony uh, starts out kind of whining. Anthony, you meet him in the beginning of the play and you don't, you don't really like him. And then he's assailed with these temptations, which are first the very obvious temptations of the seven deadly sins, and they close with the Queen of Sheba. And the Queen of Sheba, who comes in all of her finery, basically embodies all of the temptations. And so, you know, Anthony is struggles against this. And as soon as he overcomes these first temptations, a new type of temptation comes in. And this is in the form of a former student of his, Hilarion, who appears as a little child, a little deformed child. And for pages and pages and pages, he'll, he'll assail everything that Anthony ever believed. Oh, you, know, you thought the martyrs were good guys, but they really weren't. They didn't really care about anything and they were really wild. And if they could, if they could get out of it, they would have got out of it. Oh, you thought this guy was a great teacher and knew all about the faith. This guy, didn't, this incredible assailant. This is what makes it the most interesting of all of these stories. It's about the sort of intellectual war of attrition in in the belief of Anthony. And at the very end, Anthony's taken to see all the gods in the history of everything, every god that's ever been worshipped in the history of humanity, only to find out that they're all basically the same thing. And so this this. It's a really, really updated version of how terrible this temptation is. And the person who read this book and, and, and felt it, it resonated with him was none other than Cezanne. Paul Cezanne, who, you know, in all honesty, if you, I, I don't know how much art your listeners um, uh, look at, but I don't know, I, I tend to think of Cezanne and I think of, you know, just these mountain tops, he liked to paint this mountain down in kind of near X and they're like blotches of purple and yellow and green. I thought he was a landscape painter, but uh, it turns out that he painted the subject of the temptations of St. Anthony three times during his life. And he actually wrote on the question of St. Anthony. He wrote, he, he, it, 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 it obsessed him much like it obsessed Flaubert. So the first one that he does is it's got a very dark background and you have these four kind of very voluptuous yes. female figures that are all uh, arrayed around to Anthony's in the far, I'm going from memory here, Anthony's in yes, the far left yeah. hand corner in the distance. And, uh, and then interestingly, there's Anthony in the far left hand corner. And then there's one of the figures that's tempting him on the right hand corner, the closest to us has a slightly masculine look to it. And so it's kind of like Anthony in the background, and then this kind of alternate Anthony in the foreground, was kind of leading us into the story. And that part, that particular version, he uh, does in a period when uh, this is a man who who's uh, I, I, I don't know how else to put this. Um, this is a man whose licentiousness was uh, out of control. He's uh, fascinated by um, he's 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 not only obsessed with women and obsessed with sex, but he's also obsessed with violence. So that darkness you see around that figures, he lives this kind of very dark type of sexuality. And along with scenes like this one, he produces scenes called the murder, scenes called the rape. I mean, this is a this is a man who's strong struggling a great deal. And, and, and we have some quotes of his talking about women who are trying to get their hooks into them. He, he lives this very adversarial, antagonistic uh, relationship with, mm. uh, with women and um, where they're just objects. And so that's this, that's this early one he produces. Um, the middle one is is sort of like a the, uh, the just kind of a prototype. the The final one, the really the the perfected version, where you see actually the style that becomes the um, the quintessential style of um, of Cezanne, is the 1887 version, where you see Anthony, who is uh, on the he's sort of 
he's on the left hand side there's um he's up against a little green bush um there's a demonic figure that's towering over him with this slash of red i mean this really kind of violent use of red and this female figure who lifts the cover and reveals herself and all of her voluptuousness surrounded by these little little mm. children figures and 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 in particular uh we see um we see the interpretation of Flaubert because this female figure with the kind of monkeyish figure holding the staff in back of her comes from Flaubert's description of the arrival of the Queen of Sheba. The Queen of Sheba arrives beautifully dressed, but that kind of regal vision and the, the her her company her company or suggests that he's looking at uh he's thinking about what flaubert has written and then the sort of strange little baby figure in the middle uh, uh probably alludes to that hilarion that uh, flaubert writes about that's you know, tempting him in his body and tempting him in his mind and it's just that that um, the way that Cezanne is manipulating paint in this period to create a kind of a heaviness in a three dimension, and it's got a clay like feeling to it. So, where we were looking at Bosch, all of his figures are spindly and they look like they're going to waft off in the distance. And that really, if you could just, if you just, you know, if you got a leaf blower, you could just clear the whole place out from his demons. The figures of, of, of Cezanne are, are heavier and are thicker and the paint is plastered on with this with this sort of three-dimensional rise of the surface so it's something that, that that feels a lot more visceral a lot more um uh, 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 drawn mm. from the belly, as it were, uh, talking about Athanasius and how the devil tempts the young. Yeah. The, in, 19, in 1849, uh, Gautier, who's a commentator on the Paris Salon, said that there was just the place was glutted with St. Anthony's. I mean, really, the 19th century really takes a real interest in this. And the 19th century is asking itself, um, I think, also uh, an important question, especially on this cusp of Impressionism. Um, the question I think they're asking themselves is, what is art supposed to do? Because art is, it, it's visual, right? So it involves the senses. By its very nature, it must be sensual. On top of everything else, nobody makes you look at a work of art. So art has to entice you to look at it. It has to tempt you to pay attention to it. But when is it that art steps over the line into becoming a temptation to something that is, uh, 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 in Christian terms, sinful, or something that is base versus something that is meant to bring you, uh, uh, move you on a more spiritual plane? And as the Romantics create very powerful art, they're trying to draw the spirit towards the sublime, towards the higher. But now we're in the mid 19th century and we are about to produce, the artists are about to produce a whole series of works that are going to be more and more about shocking the artist when Manet produces the Olympia or the Déjeuner Solaire of these, these figures that throw a kind of a heavy sensuality, a heavy sexuality into the middle of the scene, meant to make that sort of discomfort, a vague, vague, vague feeling of what of what Anthony feels, meant to, meant to stimulate that kind of strange discomfort while you're looking at paintings. And so works like this become, as Anthony becomes a very interesting figure for them as they work out the next phase in the history of art. Okay, so when talking about Cezanne, you you talked about kind of the the artist's peculiar preoccupations and uh, problems and neur neuroses becoming kind of pre predominant in the work, and this becomes especially so in the modern era uh, where we have uh, the 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 temptation scenes, which are portrayed increasingly kind of ambiguous or not as to whether Anthony is going to win out in the end, for example, uh, and uh, on which side the artist is. Um, so we'll look at specifically Salvador Dali's and Max Ernst, which despite being kind of distinctively modern, both have precursors as I see it in, in earlier pieces. Uh, the Dali definitely does. Um, but tell us about the the uh, situation in which these were were composed. 
So those those paintings are actually one of um, two of twelve uh, works that were commissioned of the Surrealists in uh, 1945 for a film to be made based on Guy de Maupassant's Belle Amie. And um, it was supposed to be a certain size, it's going to be featured in the painting, and a number of these surrealists uh, participated. Uh, Dali, it's the only competition he ever entered, and he lost to Max Ernst. Um, the difference, I mean, something very important has happened since the 19th century's struggle with the question of the temptation of St. Anthony. The, the 19th century, uh, as these artists are struggling, um, their concerns are a little bit more along the lines of, well, will people buy my work? Um, am I going to be popular? Am I going to be ostracized? Am I going? I mean, the the 19th century's uh, issues are 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 not. Uh, they're a little bit more intellectual than they are physical. The intervening years from, let's say, the death of Cezanne to the competition in 1945 see the world change tremendously. And if the idea of temptation and horror, you know, the worst thing that can happen to you in, in, a, in a Cezanne painting is that you're going to be, uh, or, or Domenico Morelli or some of these other, you know, 19th century painters, you know, you're going to find yourself in the arms of this, you know, sort of cream puff colored woman, you know, gosh. That, that that looks pretty horrible, and even the the idea of the that 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 Bosch gives us if you 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 fall for this temptation these you, you the the eternal damnation you don't really see that in these these works you don't see the consequences of falling for temptation, but the twentieth century ushered in an era that really described horrors. The First World War and the loss of life in the trenches and the Second World War and the atomic bomb, which had a huge impact on people like Salvador Dali in particular. The diseases like the Spanish flu, which wiped out, you know, thirds of populations in some places. The the Freud and that that focus on the inward turbulence and 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 and, and muckraking of the of the psyche. So as opposed to, you know, when you went to look inwards uh, until uh, for, for many, many years, the church taught us to look inwards and you know, deal with sin and, and virtue and, and the search for salvation. Um, now we have Freud who is good bringing us into wallowing into our deepest desires. And so this is what this is what Ernst and Dali have to draw on when they are producing a whole new type of temptation, which yes, will have its have its its roots in the Bosch, in the in the figures that are chimeric or uh, in the kind of cluttered intensity of the scene, but really with a kind of new type of of hard edged horror that really brings a, a, a whole new element into into uh, 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 temptation. And and I think if you don't mind, I'd rather I think I might as well start with Max Ernst, yeah, who is the so. one who actually yeah. won the competition with his image of the uh, temptation of St. Anthony, who at this point, um, it might take a second for the viewer to find him. He's that big swath of red at the very bottom. And as you were saying, uh, these new images, you're not really sure how this is going to work out, right? We don't have the, the the image of Anthony fixated on the side of the crucifix or looking away, or as you've pointed out in many of those images, looking calm in the face of temptation. Here we have the throbbing red color. I mean, this is a man who, the, right. the color of passion, the color of, of the viscera, the color of, I mean, this is a man who is pulsing in temptation. And as a matter of fact, you see... Uh, uh, one preacher is sitting you know, on his chest, another is, is, is pulling at his eyes and his face, and another one is pulling at his groin. So he's you know, stretched across the lower part of the canvas in the throes yeah. of, this, of this temptation. And it's not very clear who's going to yeah, win disturbing. here. His face right? is kind of a gray-green color. He's kind of in agony here being 
tortured and, and molested by these creatures. And I think also um, the way that you, there's something kind of impish, the word impish comes up. There's nothing impish here. These things are really, they are monstrosities. There's nothing kind of like, oh, that'd be sort of cute to have in a cage in my room. These things would get them away from me. And look at what he's using as colors. His colors right. are unnatural. I mean, the, the sky is the mm -hmm. color of toxic waste. Uh, this metal, the, the representation of these yes. colors that are yes. very metallic, the world of machines and constructions and bits and pieces that are put together to make things that kill and destroy. It's very, very, very... Yeah, I mean, it's like a nightmare of a dentist appointment, those those metallic kind of claws. It's like being tortured by scientific implements or something. With the, since the, the one of them's got like its, its claws in the mouth of Anthony, that's particularly poignant statement. And then, and then sort of to add to it, you have that like still water, the water is calm. And on the other side, it looks like, you know, maybe, maybe it might be better over there. It's, it's a very, and it's a very kind of, uh, uh, right up in the foreground is where you have this, 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 this crunching. It seems like just, you can almost imagine the sounds of the click, click, clicks and the crunch, 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 and the grinds, grind, grind that are, that, that, that are chewing away at him. Um, and you, you kind of right. want to get over to the other side. And again, just like Bosch did, there's really nothing tempting about this temptation. It's not, it's not like that voluptuous woman of Cezanne or the, you know, there are a million of the, we didn't really talk about these, but there are a million sexy versions right. of, uh, of St. Anthony where it's like, yeah, but, but the, this is, this is not right. that. This is really a, a, a less, less of a temptation to the voluptuousness or gluttony, really. It's a temptation to despair. Yeah, yeah. There's a, uh, there's, there's a similar one, though, from the 15th century. Um, Nicolaus Manuel Deutsch, which I think is the, yes, most, the, the closest to yeah, this that I've yeah. seen, the, both in, ter in terms of the colors and the kind of yeah. hard-to-make-out nature of these creatures, uh, kind of hard to distinguish one from the other. So yeah, you mentioned kind of, yeah, th there's, there's, th these tend to go in, in the modern era in the direction of the lascivious or the blasphemous or both. I mean, we won't, we won't show these, but there's one uh, by Felician Rops, which is very, yes. uh, you know, it, it's interesting. Very, it's, it's got, yeah. it does, it does convey something real about the way that the devil, uh, you know, you read, I think a lot of us as Catholics have had this experience um, of being kind of mocked. If, we, if we're not going to give in to temptation, then the devil will just kind of try to annoy us with horrible images, sometimes blasphemous mm -hmm. thoughts. And, you know, you read about this in, uh, you know, St. Faustina experiencing this, for example, uh, just off the top of my head. Uh, and this is, I think, this is a pretty common experience for people. And and his painting does get at something of that. The only thing is that I get the impression that he's more on the side of the, the blasphemer than, you know, the person who's being tempted. Especially yeah. because, you know, if St. Faustina were telling, telling about this, she wouldn't want to show you the image and put it in your head. Um, so... Yeah. And then uh, another one, there's a number of really lascivious ones, start, especially starting in the 19th century. But yeah, there's another one by, um, well, I forget the name of the artist and it doesn't matter. But uh, but there's a lot of those where the, the lasciviousness is really played up. And I think that that first one by Cezanne uh, is like right on the edge of that. I think the final version is less so, um, less kind of like violently mm -hmm. erotic, uh, but... Uh, yeah, so you see a lot of that, um, but we're gonna go to Dali, which is very, very modern and and very Dali, but it is a more uh, traditional in its spirit, actually. I think. I, I actually was glad. I'm glad to close on Dali because I think Dali is kind of the opposite of Ernst. Um, Dali runs into trouble uh, when he starts producing. He loses a lot of his uh, fan club when he starts producing religious art because Dali takes it seriously. Dali uh, moved to Rome in the 1940s. And uh, besides A, being utterly fascinated with the um, development mm -hmm. of cinema and cinemascope, he, his paintings become much more wide angle. You can feel it in this painting too. It's this you know, 
big sort of uh, panoramic type lens. Um, but he also experiences a religious conversion. He finally marries Gala and he really, you know, thinks about uh, 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 what it, it, it's kind of like Cezanne. Interestingly, I, I forgot to mention this before. Cezanne, by the end of his life, um, he turned, he lived in X. And his room was like the room of Saint, like a room of Saint Anthony. He had just a bed in a room. I granted, I think Anthony slept on the rocks, but he had a bed in a room and a cross. And he really did, by the end of his life, hmm. live as an ascetic himself. This Cezanne, very, very interesting that this whole entire life is struggling, and he ends up uh, with this transformation. And the same thing happens with not exactly represented the same way, but Dali also experiences a tremendous religious conversion. During during this period, he really wants to represent uh, images um, images that, that 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 allow him to explore his faith. Now, obviously, Dali being Dali, he's not really going to go for your typical. <laughs> he's he's, he's going to be looking for a certain type of imagery, and so. He's particularly fascinated with the images of visions. So you have the wonderful, wonderful image of Saint John of the Cross, mm -hmm. the painting of Jesus seen from above. Um, He's very interested in in things that are connected to the atomic age, so kind of taking things apart and putting them back together again. And here, in this particular temptation of Saint Anthony, he he kind of reverses everything. This time, the creatures seem to be flying in the air, and mm. Anthony is rooted to the ground. Right, so we have these sort of these sort of strange, spindly legged uh, horses and um, horses and elephants that are making their way through a desert to him and then he kneels on the ground and you know very forcefully holding them back by lifting up the cross so as opposed to the Ernst where we see uh Anthony completely pray to these creatures here we see you know the powerful stand of the saint against these seemingly overwhelming things that have nothing to do with nature and so you see the obelisk which obviously he saw quite a few of in Rome you see uh, the nude woman, which I, I don't, I honestly, you can't have a painting by Dali without having some sort of voluptuous female figure in the nude. Um, you have the horse, uh, which among many different things, but we've seen we, we've, we've seen the horses appear before, uh, and also a symbol of a pride of 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 mm -hmm. of, of, of wrath. Um, the uh, <laughs> And the, the other sort of the tower in the background, which is very evidently phallic, and then another city sort of sitting on another cloud in the distance. So this parade of the temptations one after the other. And that a little teeny tiny bit also echoes Flaubert's way of writing about it. Um, when we read the life of St. Anthony by St. Saint Athanasius, it's, it's kind of, you know, something happens and then it's calm for a little bit and then something happens and then it's calm for a little bit. Um, in Flaubert, it's just, it's nonstop. It's it's literally like one of those action movies where just you're about you know, an hour and 10 minutes into the movie and you're like, I could, could somebody <laughs> just stop and like have coffee for a second? It's just, the action is so constant. He falls out of one immediately into another. And you get that sense that this is the moment before the onslaught of one thing after another in the in the Dali. And and it adds in this image, and this is what makes it very beautiful, this hope and this no more than hope, a certainty that that you you were you were talking about this term before with Bosch, about how Anthony turns around and says, you know, just remember, you, know, you make the sign of the cross. And you got you, you've got this, and he gives you that certainty. And so it's lovely to have this artist who's been associated with so many very peculiar ideas, seemingly almost like the slave of Freud, who worked his way through the visceral to finally understand that the great, the great strength against temptation, the great strength against any onslaught, is actually that confidence of faith. I've read people tend to interpret his his nakedness as kind of a sign of like his his only defense is the cross. He's he's weak in himself and he's and he's Absolutely. rooted on this rock, you know, which obviously is like the rock. And yeah, as you say, it's it's a good place to end um, as compared to Max Ernst. Do you have anything else to say about this whole uh, this whole tradition that we've looked at as kind of a you know, summing up? No, 
except for it'd be really interesting to see where we take this in the 21st mm -hmm. century and what like what what's the next what's the next age of of saint anthony's and we've had so many different centuries tackle the question of saint anthony what it is what would it what would the 21st century uh, what would twenty first century Saint Anthony look like? Uh, do we acknowledge? Uh, are we like the nineteenth century? Is it really just going to be about lasciviousness? Do we acknowledge that there's a, there's a temptation out there? Uh, is it politically correct? Is it mm -hmm. you know Anthony is tempted to to say the wrong thing or Elizabeth? Thank you so much for your time. We we've spent over almost three and a half hours on this over two days, as people can tell because your shirt has changed. Um, uh, yes, and uh, yes. it's been great. It's been a great journey through this this art tradition. Uh, if if you'd like to uh, get more from Elizabeth Lev, you can check out again her book "How Catholic Art Saved the Faith" from Sophia Institute Press. Okay, well, uh, thank you so much. And and again, also just as a reminder to people, we have an uh, we have a, a nice. Uh, little Way of the Fathers episode with Mike Aquilina on St. Anthony. Uh, if you'd like to know a little bit more about his significance in the monastic tradition, and then we've got the full audio book of, uh, of St. Athanasius's biography, which you can listen to on uh, catholicculture.org slash audiobooks, or you can listen to just part one of that on YouTube. So that'll appear at the suggested videos at the end. Thank you all for listening slash watching, and uh, I'll see you next time. If you'd like to uh, get more from Elizabeth Lev, you can check out, again, her book, How Catholic Art Saved the Faith, from Sophia Institute Press. Okay, well, uh, thank you so much. And, and again, also, just as a reminder to people, we have, an, uh, we have a, a nice uh, little Way of the Fathers episode with Mike Aquilina on St. Anthony. Uh, if you'd like to know a little bit more about his significance in the monastic tradition, and then we've got the full audio book of uh, of St. Athanasius's biography, which you can listen to on uh, catholicculture.org slash audiobooks, or you can listen to just part one of that on YouTube. So that'll appear at the suggested videos at the end. Thank you all for listening slash watching, and uh, I'll see you next time.